This is Dave Middlebrook with The Law and You. And thank you for joining us today for our second part in our estate planning series, where we're going to be talking about wills and trust. And I've got my great friend, Max, who's going to help me out. Max Bishop, who's going to help me out with this. It's great to see you again. Oh, thank you, bro. And you, this is what you do. That's it. Yeah. For 29 years. And this is a super important area of the law. And it impacts you personally, impacts your family. Uh, and so if you didn't have a chance to look at the prior episode, I'd encourage you to go do that because we we define some terms that I think we're going to use rather frequently here in explaining how this process works, this process called probate. Right. Now, the prior episode, we talked about wills and trusts executors. We talked about beneficiaries. We talked about um, Benef- what? Beneficiaries. Ben- we talked about advanced medical directives. Yeah. And, and we trusts. Talk- and right? trusts. Yeah. We did. Okay. So all of that, please take advantage of that because we're going to really dive in here and Absolutely. talk about how you can use this system, this probate system to more efficiently, effectively, and cost cost effectively get your assets to the folks that you want to get them to, right? Absolutely. So t- tell us, Max, what, what is the probate system? The probate system is a system where you are distributing assets to parties after you are gone. The law for many, 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 many years now has taken a, a keen interest in making sure that people's wishes were followed, or if there is no will, that assets are distributed in the way they're supposed to be distributed to loved ones. Okay, so Max, help me understand and the folks that are watching understand, because I heard you say that if you have a trust, it doesn't involve the probate system, but if you have a will, it does. That's correct. Or if you don't have a will, it does. So exactly. no will, probate. Will, probate. Trust, no probate. Right. Explain to me why. Okay, let's go through the no will, will scenario first. If you don't have a will, you are guaranteed to go through probate because the system has to pick up the ball and run with it and make sure that your stuff, whatever it is, even if you don't have a will, gets distributed to the heirs which are named by state law. Okay. If you have a will the court has to pick up the ball and run with it a little bit because they have to, A, bless the will, and then they have to distribute the assets to the beneficiaries named in the will. So so in other words, what, what I heard us kind of unpack and talk about in the prior episode is that if you don't have a will, your state, no matter what state it is, is going to write one for you. Your you legislature bet. is going to write one you for bet. you. You bet. And I guarantee you right here and right now, you're not going to like their will. Okay. Okay. If you do have a will, so you've taken the time, you've given some thought to it, hopefully gone to an attorney and gotten a will, you're still going to have to go to probate because the court's going to have to bless that as well. That's right. And also, when you have a will, the will doesn't take effect until after you're gone. Okay. So the court is going to have to do that work for you. And and that means you can change your will as often as you want up until the time you pass. Absolutely. As long as you're legally competent, you can sign a new will every day of the week if you wanted to. Okay. Do you have any stories, I mean, funny anecdotes about somebody that's changing their will all the time? I have a, a pretty good story about a guy who was married three or four times. And just before he passed, he passed when he was about 86 years old. But before he passed, he came to us and he wanted to get his will revised because he was coming into Texas from California. As now, they all are doing. As they all are doing. <laughs> just kidding, and California. He, um, he came to us and he needed to take his California docs and make them Texas docs. Well, when he did that, he made all the changes he wanted and he executed his changes. So everything's good. And then right after he signed his new will, he got remarried. Okay. Now, when he got remarried, his new wife assumed that she would be the beneficiary of his will. Well, soon after he got married, he passed away. And there was a contest filed because the wife wanted to have assets that she thought were hers under the 
the fact that she was married. And the court said, no, ma'am, you weren't married to him long enough to be actually a beneficiary under his will. There are certain things that you have the right to do. You have the right to live in the house and things like that. But we ended up getting a handwriting expert involved. We ended up having a long hearing in front of the judge who finally said, ma'am, here's the story. You weren't married to him long enough to really receive a lot of his assets. Okay, so I have so many questions. <laughs> First of all, um, if he were moving from California, he, he moved from California to Texas. Right. Was Is that a trigger for him to get a new will? Absolutely. Okay. When you change states for okay. whatever reason, I don't care if they're both community property states, I don't care if they're not, you're going to have to get a new will. And in the, the state where you primarily reside, what we call in the business your domicile, yep. um, is that the place you want to have your will done? Because so just hypothetically, let's say I own uh, my home in Texas and my ski thing in Vail and my my beach house in Malibu, okay? But I really live in Texas. I mean, I'm a Texas resident. Where would I get my will done? You would get your will done in Texas. Okay. You live here. Most of what happens to you, good or bad, happens to you here. We need to have Texas documents. Okay. Second question I have about your war story. What was the age difference between the gentleman and the second wife? Well, let's put it to you this way. The second wife was younger than most of the kids. Ah, so that yeah. explains... It explains a lot. Explains a lot. She was not mom. She was not close to being mom. And, and just to be clear, what you were telling me, what I heard you say, is that she wasn't married to him long enough to actually be the spouse contemplated in the will? That's exactly right. Remember, she was married to him after he signed his will. Ah, so he should have gotten a new will if he wanted to exactly. when he married her. And this brings up an interesting point because no matter what your age is, if you are getting remarried, that is a magical time to be getting a will. Okay. Because in the law of most states, you want to provide for that spouse and you want to provide for that spouse outside of what you would provide to your children from your previous spouse. And it's one of those things, it's one of those magical moments that after you get married again, it's really something you need to do. It's one of the things that we see a lot of. Okay. Now, can we switch and talk about trust for a second? Sure. Now, I... I, I know people get confused about the distinction between a will and a trust. And again, one of the things I heard you say in the prior episode is trusts don't go to probate. That's right. Okay, so how does that work? First of all, a trust is a separate legal entity. What it really is is a box with flaps. You control the flaps. You own the box. Metaphorically. Metaphorically. It's absolutely. not a box. It's We're not, not going to send you a box. But, no. But it's a, it's a, it's a container... Yep. That you're going to put your stuff in. And you're going to put your stuff in it while you're alive. Okay, what kind of stuff? You can put in real estate. You can put in stocks, bonds. Cars? You could put a car in there. We don't recommend that, but you could. Bitcoin? Um, Bitcoin, you bet, depending on your account. You could put anything you want into this trust. What about a timeshare? Timeshare, you bet. So we my stuff, that. I'm going to start putting in my trust box. Yep. Why? Because you want the assets owned by the trust at the time you pass. Okay. Why do you want that? Answer, because if they're owned by the trust, that means they're not owned by you, which means they're not subject to probate. Keeps you out of probate. Those assets that go into the trust, they're not going to be in probate. Okay, so do you see the same... Um, I have lots of questions about this. Uh, do you see the same contest? And when you say contest, that's a, that's a nice kind of courteous way of saying lawyers fighting in court and yeah. spending a lot of money. All yes. right. Do you see the same kind of contest over trust? No. And the reason is, is that number one, probate courts or courts that handle probate matters don't often have jurisdiction over trust assets. Why? Because the trust assets don't go through probate court. Why? Because you don't own them. The trust does. Okay, well, well, if that's true, then how do, if, if I put my house and my timeshare and my car and my Malibu, time, whatever, <laughs> beach house, it's all in there. If it belongs to the trust, then how do I get to use it? Answer, you are the trustee. Ah. 
When you're a trustee of a trust, you're managing the assets in the trust. And you may, especially here on the laws of Texas, you may have a beneficial, what we call a beneficial interest in the trust, which is a nice way of saying you can use whatever's in the trust. Okay, so my wife and I are going to have the same box, right? In most instances, most, yes. Okay, and so we both have the same. So in effect, it's kind of a legal, what we call a legal fiction, right? I mean, it is. It's, it, it's a legal fiction designed to avoid probate and probate taxes. That's exactly right. And when you talk about probate taxes, we're talking about things like what you see in California. California, for example, has statutory probate fees. Okay. So the smaller your probate estate, the less fees you're going to pay to a lawyer. Okay, we're going to get into that in a minute. But but I an, another another thing that I wanted to ask you about, and we didn't touch upon it in the prior episode, and that is when talking about trust, you hear the term irrevocable. Am I saying that right? Yes. Irre I say irrevocable, right. but irrevocable or can't be revoked, and then revocable right. can be revoked. Yep. Revoke meaning get rid of it. Get rid of it. Okay, so explain the difference between the two and how that works. When you have an irrevocable trust, you are creating a trust the terms of which cannot be changed. So if you create a trust with terms, say, in 2015, that trust is going to have those same terms for the rest of the, the existence of the trust. Okay. Now, there are tax reasons why you would do that. There are creditor protection reasons why you would do that. But it is a much more involved and there's a, it's a much more involved process, Dave. And it's a much more, shall we say, severe process. In other words, there's going to be tax implications, things like that. These are large people with large estates? Would... Typically, yes. Okay. These are people that have estate tax issues, people who own more assets than what the current federal estate tax exemption level is. So they're creating these trusts to remove those assets from their estate. So I, I don't know, you probably don't know, but I assume that Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and these billionaires out there, they're going to have irrevocable trust for all the reasons you just described. They probably have created irrevocable trusts that have assets in them even today. I don't say that right, do I? It's, it's, it, it, it's, it, I'm trying to, it's uh, it, irrevocable. It's, we always use the words revocable and irrevocable, but you know what? It doesn't really matter. You can do, do it 50% one way and 50% the other. Well, apparently in the Tulsa Public Schools, they taught it's me like to say It's like potato and potato. <laughs> it okay. really is. Is there a mechanism by which a revocable trust becomes irrevocable? Absolutely. Okay, how does when that work? The creator of the revocable trust is deceased. That trust automatically becomes irrevocable. And if my wife and I have created a revocable family trust... And I pass first. She's still alive. Yep. She still has control over the trust and it is still revocable. You know, I have to say, I, I understand. I, I, You and I have a common uh, professor in, in common in terms of this yep. whole area of the law. But I, I think for a lot of folks, the idea of title passing away from them into a trust is a bit scary. Yep. Is that so, how do you deal with that? Well, we remind them that in these trusts, we're naming them as their own trustees. Okay. Now, here in Texas, that's perfectly valid, and we do it every day of the week. You'll have a John and Mary Doe. They'll create the John and Mary Doe revocable trust. They'll name John and, John and Mary Doe as the trustees of that trust. They are managing their own assets inside that trust. I think that's one of the ways that we get them over that hesitancy, and they realize they're not losing any control over their property. They're, in fact, getting better control over it. Better control how? Well, first of all, the trust provides that they are the trustees and they can manage the assets. Typically, a revocable trust will have provisions in it that say, if one of us becomes disabled, then the other one continues to act on behalf of the trust. Most good trusts will provide terms that create criteria for disability. For example, if a doctor has determined one of us is disabled, we're disabled. If two doctors have determined we're disabled, we're disabled. If my spouse and a doctor have determined we're disabled, we're disabled. 
the, all of these different criteria can go into the trust and determine dis disability, and they can determine recovery too if they really want to. Okay, so um, what happens if there's a divorce? I assume that's provided for in the trust. It does. Um, the, typically, a trust becomes to an end upon divorce. Okay. If you have parties who are settlers or creators of the trust, the assets in the trust are distributed out of the trust per the terms of the divorce decree, and the trust terminates. Okay. Um, we've talked about what you can put in this box, uh, this trust box. Yep. Um, I can put my 401k in there? No. Okay. Are there other things I can't put in You there? cannot put your IRA in there. Okay. Um, Why and is that? Because it's federal law. When you have an individual retirement account, which is what IRA stands for, it's individual, the IRS really means you are the individual, your trust cannot own that. Now, if you are gone, you can name your trust as a beneficiary of your IRA, but your IRA cannot be owned by your trust while you're alive. Okay. Anything else that you can't put in it? Things like annuities. If you have an existing annuity, you probably do not want to put that annuity into the trust during your lifetime. And an annuity is not a nickname for your brother-in-law. <laughs> exactly. Tell them what an annuity is. An annuity is simply an investment where a company has legally agreed to pay you a specific amount of money each and every month over the course of your lifetime. And in not oftentimes, but many times, for example, in a personal injury suit. Absolutely. Uh, instead of a lump sum, they'll pay you out a greater amount over a period of time, and it, it, annuity being annualized payments, I guess. And you may have heard of a term like structured settlement. That's right. A structured settlement is almost always an annuity. Okay, and that cannot go into a... And it should not, well, I say it can go in there, but it should not. There are tax implications to transferring an existing annuity into a trust. Definitely inadvisable. Okay. So now we've talked about wills. We've talked about trust. Um, if, if someone is considering doing uh, one, or, do you do both? We do both. Okay. It, but if you have if you have a a, a trust, you, you're not going to have a will. If you have a trust, you have to have a will. In the business, it's called a pour over will. What a pour over will does is it takes care of any assets that were not placed into the trust prior to your passing. So if there's a bank account you forgot about, if there's a piece of real estate that you acquired after you created the trust that wasn't deeded into the trust, that pour over will distributes that asset into the trust. So it's like a fishing net. We're using all those Absolutely. word pictures. You're just going to yep. go get everything else that gonna, you didn't think about. You're going to collect all of that stuff and throw it into the box. And and that does that put you back into probate or does that? It does put you back into probate, which is one of the reasons why the trust works best when it's funded. Okay. In other words, if you're going to an attorney and you tell the attorney, I want to create a trust, you better be prepared to place the assets that you want placed into the trust into the trust. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, the attorney will do that. And in many cases, your financial advisor will have to do it. Same question I ask you about a will. Uh, should you just, if somebody's watching, they're thinking, well, that sounds nifty. I think I'll go get myself a trust. Right. Should they go online, just Google and get a little form to fill out? Or does this require professional? This is definitely a professional point. You're about to get into very deep water in terms of estate planning if you're doing a trust. Okay. If you do the trust, on your own, that deep water is going to look very deep and it's going to have a lot of sharks in it. Okay. Um, so another thing that I've heard uh, folks say is, well, if I, get a, if I get a trust, then I'm immune from getting sued. Is that true? If you have an irrevocable trust, the answer is the assets inside of that trust very often are immune from suit. Your typical revocable trust, when the trust is revocable, is not immune from suit. Now, most of the clients that we meet don't have this issue. They have either a great car insurance or home insurance or insurance that keeps them from being worried about being sued. 
One of the things that we talk about when we're doing trusts are what are called umbrella policies, where people are buying large amounts of casualty coverage to make sure that in the event they are sued, they're covered by the policy and not having to dip into the trust. Um, we talked about vacation homes here in the United States, but what if somebody owns property in France or Italy or whatever? Is that not going to be part of it? It depends or? on the country. We have seen, first of all, people who can transfer property in places like England into a trust here. Some England of the, loves trusts, right? They, do. They, they, they founded trusts. Well, they certainly adapted them yeah. to their own purposes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that on the whole, when you have a trust and you're trying to place property outside of this country into the trust, you're going to have to hire a lawyer in that country to do the transfer. Okay. For sure. Okay. Another thing that I hear folks say is uh, if I have a trust as opposed to a will, then I'm going to not have to pay any estate taxes. That is both true and not true. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but both, most trusts can reduce or even eliminate some taxes. I've seen it happen and, and it works. The problem that people have with trusts is that they're creating a revocable trust during the lifetime of the person who created that trust, that revocable trust, there's no estate tax planning. Okay. And that trust is not going to reduce their estate taxes and it's not going to reduce their taxes at death. On the other hand, if they're creating an irrevocable trust and they're placing assets in that trust while they're alive, they are reducing their tax bill when they pass, and the assets in that trust are flowing freer. Okay. Just to kind of begin to wrap this up, help us understand um, the issue. We talked about executors. We talked about beneficiaries. All is related to a will. That's right. So how does that work in terms of how that occurs and I'll give you a hypothetical. Uh, my wife and I have a revocable trust. Right. Uh, and we put all of our stuff in there, in our box. And there's a simultaneous uh, incident and we both pass. Right. Okay. What happens? Well, the assets which are in the trust are not subject to the will. Why? Because you didn't own them at the time you passed. Okay. The assets which named the trust as a beneficiary go into the trust and are not subject to probate. The only things that could be subject to probate are anything that did not go into the trust at the time you passed or were not owned by the trust at the time you passed. Now, if the kids are fighting over your personal effects, that could be a moment of probate. Okay. If you have debts and you need to settle those debts, we would be filing a probate. Okay. But other than that, you've really reduced or eliminated probate for you. Okay, and so um, our will is going to say who gets the stuff in the box? Who gets the stuff in the box? The box is going to say who gets okay. the stuff in the box. And that's one of the beautiful things about trusts. Trusts are what we call testamentary or dispositive documents, meaning they do transfer stuff at death. If the trust has those provisions, all the will is saying that our stuff, which is not subject to the trust at the time of passing, goes into the trust. Okay. When you see these wills, the wills only name one beneficiary, and that's the trust. That way, you're carrying out the terms of your estate plan, even if stuff wasn't owned by your trust at the time you passed. But, but doesn't that avoid, and, and I I'm, say this a little facetiously because it, it's, it's really a question. Uh, I watch in the movies, and there's always the reading of the will. So if I have a trust, there's no reading of the will, right? There's no reason to have a reading of the will because the will doesn't control anything. Okay, so how many times have you had to read the will? I've had to do it. I have to count two times. Two times in 30 years, right? 29. 29 years. Yeah. Biggest anticlimax of my life. <laughs> Come on. That's when, the, that's when the murder happens and the candlestick and the rope. And the first one, Dave, was a situation where the guy owned a lot of personal effects. And he had five children, and his five children actually got along. But I had to sit there, and this took about an hour and a half, and read off who got what personal effects. 
It was a snooze fest. Personal effects meaning like the watch, the belt. The, the Rolex watch goes to my daughter, Bonnie. My little painting in the um, side bedroom goes to my son, Andy. You know, that sort of thing. Just, yeah. just, And this went on literally for an hour and a half. Everybody was ready for a nap. Okay. It was the most anticlimactic thing you've ever seen. Disappointing. Yep. Um, let me ask you another question. You know, a lot of our clients uh, are very interested uh, in, in making sure that there's a legacy gift uh, left to their church. Yep. Uh, uh, how, how does that, how does a, a trust? Typically, when we do legacy gifts for churches, the church is named in the distribution portion of the trust. Okay. And usually the church is first. In other words, it's a charity. It's going to receive its money prior to the time the kids receive their shares. Okay. We usually do that either in terms of a cash gift, you know, say $10,000 to my church, or there may be a percentage portion that goes to the church. Either way works fine. So it's almost like paying a bill like you were talking about yep. at the very beginning of the, once that has a, event has occurred, we're going to take care of obligations of the trust. Yep. And that would be one of them? That would be one of them. Okay. So to recap the last two episodes, um, I, what I hear you say is that if you don't have a will, you want one. Absolutely. Ir irrespective of your relative wealth and you're not Jeff Bezos or whatever, you want to have a will because if you don't have one, the state in which you live has written a will for you and you're not going to like it. That's exactly right. And it's not that expensive. Very cheap. And you should get a good qualified attorney like yourself that can help uh, do the will. Absolutely. If, if in the course of conversation with that attorney, they determine that you have assets that are maybe more than the norm or there's lots of property, then that's the time to start having the discussion about a trust. The trust comes up in two aspects. Number one, if we have a potential for disability for either you or your spouse, a lot of families, they have genetic dis you know, predispositions to some form of disabling mm -hmm. illness. Number two, if you own real estate outside the state of your residence, say you're a resident of the state of Texas and you own property in Kansas, we're going to talk to you about doing the trust because if you do the trust, you're avoiding probate here in Texas and you're avoiding probate in Kansas because you're going to have to do a probate to move that property in Kansas. Okay. And, and then finally, um, the, there's cost savings associated with doing this. Absolutely. One of the things that you hear folks say is, well, there's all these estate taxes. Now, I know the number has gone up considerably while we've had a Republican administration yes. and Congress, et cetera. But that number is? It's currently $11.7 million per person. Wow. So it's a lot. It but, is. But there's no guarantee, is there, that that number is going to stay that high? It is the biggest political football in Washington. The Democrats want to bring it down. The Republicans want to keep it up. Right. And right now, of course, we have a Democratic president and we have a lot of Democratic senators and we have a Democratic House. We, so, the Democrats call it an estate tax and Republicans call it a death tax. Exactly. Well, that's exactly right. Right. And it's in, spot on. And they're... In their descriptions of it, that's exactly the way they look at it, okay. and it's how it's it's who they think they represent that that really determines their language for sure. You know, as as I've listened to you, uh, I, I don't feel a lot of motivations or, or things that are motivating people to do this or in, inspiring people to do this is to save money on taxes. It's because of all the other reasons, right? Well, most people worry about taxes last. Right. There's an adage in my office, which is don't let the tax tail wave, you know, wag the common sense dog. Okay. Make sure that you're taking care of each other first. Make sure you're taking care of your kids the way you want to, and then worry about the taxes. Okay. Well, this has been a great episode, and I, I hope you found this enjoyable. I hope you found it educational. And most of all, I hope you heard, it, you heard us and you were motivated, uh, if you don't have a will or an estate plan, to go get one because it's really important.
And thank you, Max, for being here, bro. Thank you. Uh, just so much appreciate your expertise. And if you have any questions about this episode or about estate planning generally or any other topic, then you can email me at the email address below. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Law and You.